Celeb Savant is a career retrospective type interview focusing on singers, actors and industry experts. Join Barrett Edelstein now as he dives into the entertainment world. With 11 studio albums to his name, whilst receiving legendary status as a globally respected purveyor of the blues for over 10 years, guitarist and singer-songwriter South African Dan Platansky is one of the world's finest blue-based storytellers of his generation. Voted the number four best guitarist in the world, Dan remains the only artist in the world with two worldwide number one as well as two worldwide number two best blues rock albums as voted by Blues Rock Review USA. Dan has headlined his own sold-out shows all around the world, as well as opening for the likes of Joe Satriani and Bruce Springsteen, to name a few. His 11th and latest release, Moving On, was released in 2024. Up next on Celeb Savant, we've got Dan Petlansky. Where in the world are you and how are you doing? (laughs) It's great to be with you. I'm currently... Very briefly at home in Pretoria, um, in my home studio, and then off to off to Europe soon. So it's it's great to be home and great to be on your podcast. Thank you you for joining us. And now tell us where are you going in Europe? Um, It's actually I'm I'm wrong. It's actually the UK, which I you know I keep forgetting about Brexit and all that sort of nonsense. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. yeah. So so it's 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 a UK um, tour, and we are doing one show in Budapest like on the way back home. Um, yeah, so that's that's the next tour we're doing, and yeah, look forward to it. Okay, yeah, so now let's rewind. At what age did you realize, cool, you want to be in the entertainment music world, whether it was a child or teenager, and how did that journey progress to where we are today? Well, so, you know, I grew up listening to a lot of music. You know, I didn't really grow up with necessarily people playing music and making music, but it was parents that listened to music all the time. So... I think I had a fantastic upbringing musically, you know, f- uh, from them. Um, and, you know, it's a, it was always a dream to be able to play guitar and make music for a living. But, you know, it was always more of a pipe dream than, you know, it, was, it never seemed to be a reality. It was like going to Los Angeles to be an actor, right? It's like your, your chances of success are, are very, very small. It's great to... To finally, there, there, there was like a time in my life where I realized, wow, I'm actually getting paid to do this. It, this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. And that's when I kind of realized for the first time that, you know, there's, there's some level, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing this. I'm doing it professionally now. And, you know, you know from then, I just kind of kept on pushing away at it, um, kept touring. I think that the secret is, is touring as much as you possibly can um, just to keep to get it going. And, um, and yeah, it's just kind of built slowly, but surely, very slowly, but surely, you know, over the last, you know, 30 something years of eventually kind of, you know, still not there yet where I want to be, but, you know, kind of getting a little bit more well known, getting better gigs, being able to see the world travel and, you know, get paid to do that. So that's really it, you know. Before you realized that it was something that you were making money from. Did, were you doing any other sort of day jobs on the side? Not really. Um, you know, I started it young enough, right? And I think that's an important thing about making it in the music industry. It's a lot easier if you start younger because you don't necessarily need to make X amount of money a month to cover your home loan, this, that, the next thing, school fees, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, that's a lot harder when you're a little bit more established and you're a little bit older. So that afforded me to not get a day job and just to really focus all my time and energy, you know, on doing what I do um, and, and not having to worry too much about money because I'm still young, still living at home. Um, so I've never really had a day job in my life, uh, you know, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm blessed to say that, that I haven't had a day job. I've always... Um, managed to make the music thing work, um, you know, not necessarily earning a, a, enough money from it back in the day, but just young enough to push through and to be able to just take it to the next level, take it to the next level, take it to the next level. 
you mentioned that you're going on tour, so you've obviously naturally performed your own headline shows, you've opened by the artists and so forth. So first of all, what do you enjoy about performing? Everything. For me, that is the bread and butter, not, not, not just financially, but just for my soul. That, 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 that's why I do this, you know. Um, I love performing live. Uh, live. I love um, kind of feeding off an energy of an audience, right? And, you know, the, the energy of an audience really dictates on how the show goes, you know, because, you know, a big part of what I do is improvised, and is on the spot, um, you know, a, a, a great audience reaction and a great energy from an audience really makes the world of difference. It really, really pushes in, 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 a, in, a, in a fantastic way. So for me, it's everything. And I think also just by default now, the way the music industry um, has turned out is it's the only way you can actually make a living in today's world, you know, is by performing live because there's, there's not much revenue anymore from album sales because of the streaming thing. Um, you know, which has its ups and downs to the streaming thing. Um, so it kind of suits me in a way that I've got to tour more and I can't just sit back and record music and release it and earn a living from that. So, yeah, that's really it for me. It's just that energy from an audience that, that makes me love performing live so much. Okay, so I've got a point of discussion. Here. So I've spoken to a lot of artists with this. Some are pro, some are against. So I'd like to hear your perception. I'm normally that person that's right in front. Jamming, I'll take my cell phone out, put my cell phone out, and maybe one or two videos, one or two photos, and then I'll put it away. I notice people around me oftentimes, 60, 70, 80% of the time, filming, tweeting, posting, photoing, recording. From a person that's receiving that, do you not feel that that takes away that energy connection you were referencing, or is it just where society is at? It's a strange thing. It, it, it really is. It's... um. It always makes me <laughs> makes me like like very confused when I'm, you know, people have paid, say for instance, at a, at, a, at a show, a music show, people have paid a bunch of money for a ticket and they're kind of watching it through the screen of their phone or the lens okay. of their, their camera, right? Which, you know, you, you could probably be more comfortable doing that on YouTube or something from, you know, from, from your couch, you know? So I'm a little bit old school in that sense that I really, really like, um, to experience things with my own eyes in reality and not, you know, kind of experience everything through the lens of my camera and kind of get information and people's opinions from social media and stuff like that, right? It's a strange thing. I think it's kind of maybe I'm part of that generation that I find the phone an awesome tool. I, I really do. It's, it's an awesome tool. And Yes, I probably spend way way too much time on my phone compared, you know, compared to if we didn't have it and, and and what I would like. But I'm definitely not a person that that believes in, you know, using my phone as kind of like a comfort blanket. I think that's what what you were kind of describing when you're out there. Is people use their, their their phones because there's no one to talk to and they're feeling awkward, so they just go into this in, into this other world. You know, it, it, it's a it's a crazy thing, and you know. On, on, on the phone front and the digital front, when it comes to stuff like streaming and stuff, I think, you know, as I said, there's, there's massive ups and downs with it. I think the downs are musicians are getting kind of screwed over royal, uh, royally on, on, on money, on people listening to, to, to their music. But on the upside, your music can be available to everyone on the planet instantaneously, right? And, you know, in the, in the past, you would need a record label, you would need, you know, I don't know. You'd need other things in place for that to happen. So I don't know. It was a very roundabout way of answering the question, but I hope, <laughs> I, hope, I, well, I, mean, hope I, I answered it. But I love me a CD. I budget my CDs. Yes. I like the aesthetic of it, holding it, the journey of choosing, receiving, opening, looking at the pamphlets, listening to the album from beginning to end. I'm not sure if you're aware that CDs alone last year in the UK, 5.9 million sales, biggest since 1990. CDs are on the upper trajectory again, as well as the sets. And it's the younger, it's the teenagers and the early 20s that are buying it. You've referenced the streaming and that's the pros and cons. So what are your observations or thoughts around physical versus streaming? Well, I think we're of a, a similar generation, just hearing, you know, just hearing your question and, and what you love to do about, what you love about a CD. That was the same for me. That was my, that was my youth going into a CD shop and, 
grabbing five CDs you want to listen to, and you go to one of those like listening to sta- listening stations, mm-hmm. and there, there's a dude behind there that puts the CD in, and and, and you get you, you get to kind of give the CD a go and see if you want to buy it. So that's my generation. So my feeling on physical product is massive. I love it. I way way prefer it. I think it's more special. Um, I also think your focus when you're listening to a CD is far more focused on the album than just streaming because streaming yeah. is so so quick so easy that you tend to listen to one song from an album you like and then you you go to another song from a different album and from a different genre and you you keep jumping right and that's a kind of world of a short attention span type of yes. thing right but if you make the effort of opening a box a cd box putting it into your cd play if it's in your car or if it's in your, your house or whatever the case is you're more likely to listen to the whole album from beginning to start right and that's that's my my world, right? I absolutely love it, and you know, obviously, just from a financial perspective, it's 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 great to have a merch table at a show that's got CDs, it's got vinyls, it's got physical product that people can buy. You can meet the fans, you can meet someone who's buying the CD, you can have a quick chat to them about the CD, you can actually sign the CD for them, and you know, that's a special thing for them. You know what I'm saying? It is so. I'm definitely on the same page as you regarding physical product. It really is. And it's such, it's, it really is fantastic news to hear that CDs are making a comeback. That some sort of physical products making a comeback, you know, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Okay. So now tell us about the latest album. Okay. Latest album moving on. Um, you know, in a nutshell is really an album that I've wanted to make for the last 10 years of my life. And you know, just didn't have the guts to make it um, for many reasons. Um, you know, some of the reasons were people that were in my life, um, if it was producers, management, all that kind of stuff going, no, that's not the way you need to go in this particular direction. Or if it was PR people telling me that. And also just wondering that if I made made the album I really wanted to make, um, are existing fans, am I going to lose existing fans? You know, so thankfully that hasn't been the case. And, and the... The response you know, from the new album, well, for the new album, has been overwhelmingly fantastic, which is a relief more than anything. Um, and the reason I say it's the album I've wanted to make for the last 10 years is um, I want to make an album that, if I die tomorrow, it would be, I'd want to be remembered by that particular sound, those particular songs, and the way it was arranged and, and performed, um, which is very much a roots, back to my roots a real raw live sound. That's what I was really after. And it's risky because you, 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 you releasing an album that just sounds, and I know it sounds weird when I put it this way, but it just sounds like a band performing in a room. Right. And then, then you think to yourself, shouldn't all albums be like that? The band exactly, yeah. performing in a room. It's like, that's the way they sound live. Right. Yeah. It's just a very, very good live performance. Right. That, you know, you've picked, you've picked a, a great take. And that's really what this album was. And another thing that was, that was weighed heavy on me with this album was if I wasn't the artist, this must be an album that I would buy, you know, that I would buy and want to listen to. And, you know, I, I feel, you know, just for, for, for myself, I feel I've definitely achieved that and am very, very proud of kind of the final results of that album and relieved that people are enjoying the album. That is, that, <laughs> that's a big one for me because you never know. You know, you lose perspective of what the album is after a while because you've listened to it so much and you've got to hold this, this album back until the release date. Yeah. And, you know, one morning you wake up and think, this is the best album I've made. Um, and then the very next day you're like, this is the worst album ever recorded by beast or man in human history. And maybe I should just scrap it, you know? So you see, so your mind goes through this, this, this crazy roller coaster drive. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So how was it, how is it different to your previous releases? So it's different in the sense that, um, it, you know, obviously it's always been, uh, uh, my music's always been based on the blues and the blues rock thing. There's, there's no doubt about it. Um, but I think the big difference is, is, when we wrote, when we started off at the beginning writing the songs, uh, me and the guys I was writing with, who are my band, you know, I gave them a very very clear, I suppose, objective and direction of where I wanted to go for the album, and I think we all got that, and we were all on the exact same page with that. So when we wrote the songs, we wrote it with that in mind. So from the core, 
the songs were in the direction I wanted it to be in. Um, so that was the, the, the one thing. And yeah, I, it just definitely went more back to what I love more, more to the, to, to the roots, more to the traditional blues thing, even though it's, it's in no way, shape or form a traditional blues album, but there's a lot more of that happening on the album, right? Which means it performs more naturally because that's what I naturally do better. Um, and then also maybe the final thing that was a big difference is not one song and none of the time in studio did we ever think about going, ah, oh, we need a single for radio. We need a single for this. We need a single for that. We need, we didn't write, you know, for a particular purpose. Like, oh, this will be, we need to write something that the chorus starts with in the next, in the, in the first 27 seconds and it's this tempo and it's this long. The cookie cutter, right, of what... For, for TikTok. Of what, now the latest thing is yeah. for TikTok. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for TikTok, exactly, you know. Um, so, so none of that happened. And, you know, I think in previous albums, it was always in the back of my mind, it's like, oh, we need a single. We need something that's got a chance on radio. We need that. And that ends up always, always being the, 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 the least liked song on the album by, by my audience and the least streamed, the least listened to song. Because I think it was written and produced with the wrong intention. Yeah. You know, so we, we completely, I completely shut that out and just said, we're just going with, with our guts on this. But those days that you were woke up and you thought this is the worst album ever and no one's going to love it, et cetera, et cetera. How did you get out of that mindset? Well, because this is like album number 10 or 11. I mean, this has happened, you know, for, for, for the last, decade and a little bit right it's like it's it's um it's this kind of having a a long hard look at yourself in the mirror when you listen to yourself back and you've you've put your heart and soul onto down on tape and it's going to be released so you tend to listen depending on your mood you know either in a super hypercritical like overly critical way um and then other days you just listen like everyone else would you know not yeah, and, yeah. you know, when you, and sometimes I would love to be able to, to hear my own music like that. Like I'm listening to someone else where you just listen, it's just coming out the speakers and, you know, you, you, you're enjoying it. Right. And those are the days where I think it's great. So for me, because I've done, been doing this for a while now, I know somewhere in, inside me that it's probably the mood I'm in, in today, you know, my, maybe my ears are tired and I'm being hyper 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 critical of 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 what i've done so i tend to try then stop you know, stop listening to it and give it a good rest so don't try and listen to it every day give it a two week rest don't listen to the album don't even think about the album for two weeks and then pop it on in in a different mindset um and that tends to fix fix all the problems for me right and just listen to it for what it is when you're listening to music Naturally, I'd say by other artists, are you able to ever just just relax and listen, or is your creative technical brain unpacking what the other artists have done? Such a brilliant question. It's a brilliant question, and this is a you know you know I always I always say I would love to be able to listen to music like my wife listens to music. Right? She's got fantastic music tastes, all that listens to great stuff, but because she's not a musician, she listens to music like music should be listened to right she you know she, she'll listen to melodies and lyrics and whatever guitar solos or whatever it is and it, it, it's a soul thing it's like it will be like that speaks to me that that song speaks to me or that part of the song speaks to me um and you know that's how i would like to listen to my to be able to listen to my own music and also a lot of other people's music you know um I tend to because, yeah, especially on the guitar front, you're always listening for the technicalities in the guitar thing, the tone, the this, all, all the, I suppose, quite nerdy stuff that, that comes along with being like a guitar player and, and, and a musician. Um, and in a way, it ruins, it ruins, it can ruin the song for you. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you, you're never listening to it because that artist didn't intend you to listen to the song by going, wow, he's doing this, and wow, listen, isn't that very clever chord change and, and all this, this, this technical theoretical stuff? That's not the intention. It really isn't. It's, ne- it's not mine when I, when, I, when I write an album. Yeah. So I, I can't imagine it's any other artist thing. So it's almost doing the artist a disservice by listening to it, but it's so, so hard to switch that side of the brain off. You know, it, you almost got to have a few good few whiskeys in you 
just to switch that conscious part of your brain off and, and yeah. listen to the music for what it is, you know? So you reference that this is your 10th and 11th album. You've been in the industry over a decade. What keeps you going? Well, I think for me, it's, it's the addiction of, 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 impro- of improvement and, and getting better. That, that's, that's the thing that, that drives me, you know? Don't get me wrong. Got a massive passion for music, a massive, a massive passion for songwriting, all that. But in every one of those little compartments in what I do, you know, I'm always striving to be better, um, you know, to keep going and make the next album better, to, to make the next live show better, to be able to play better at the live show, improvise better, sing better, perform better, entertain better. All, all of that stuff, it's, it's this, this addiction to keep doing it better, keep doing it better. Um, and, you know, my inspiration really comes from, for the most part, it comes from many places, but the biggest slice of inspiration I get is from listening to other artists that inspire me. You know, you know, some people say, well, it's, you know, love is the biggest inspiration and or, you know, a sunset with the wind blowing through the trees. I mean, that's great stuff, great inspiration. And you write great songs from that stuff. But for the most part, if I want to be inspired to, to write better songs, I listen to songwriters that inspire me if if i want to be a better guitar player i listen to guitar players inspire that, that inspire me singers you know it, it kind of goes that way and for me there's nothing more exciting when i hear for instance a guitar player that can play something that i can't i don't understand but it really speaks to my soul that is like so those are those inspirational moments where a fire is lit and you go i need to be able to do that as soon as possible or i i need to i want to write a song as good as that or half as good as that on my next album you know and for me that's where that <clears throat> that constant furnace you know that that fire keeps coming from yeah, yeah. performing live improvisation what do you yes. mean by that obviously because everything's reversed and there's a set list so what do you mean by improvisation and performing live right so what I mean by that is it's you know because of the nature of what I do this guitar driven blues rock type of thing the guitar as an instrument is is a very very big key part of what I do, and the guitar solos, and it's you know it's it's part you know part of the reason why it's not the most commercial music because there's long guitar solos, there's a lot of that. So when it comes to improvising, the song itself is structured in, in a certain way, rehearsed as you say, arranged like that. The lyrics and the melody and the chords will be the same every night. But when it comes to the guitar solos, which, as I say, is a big part, those will be completely different every night. There's no preconceived idea on what's going to be played. It's not like I'm, you know, I'm learning whatever solo I did on the record. I'm learning that and memorizing it and playing it note for note. It's felt and played completely differently every night, which kind of, that, that's another thing that keeps me interested in music is that, that, that ability to be able to improvise and see where the music goes on a on a particular night, but as you can imagine, music sometimes if you're not feeling it on a particular night won't be your best night at you know at the office because it's an improvised thing and you're not thinking about it. You're just going, you're just playing, mm. and if you're not in the right headspace or in the right your heart's not in the right space, it doesn't always go to go as planned, right? But then on the other side, when it goes right. It, there's, there's kind of no feeling in the world quite like it, right? Where you've just kind of out of fresh air, you've strung this the solo together that makes sense to you at the time and, yeah. and you get this fantastic reaction from the audience. So that's kind of what I mean by improvise. It's really just the guitar playing, really, the guitar solos, and there's a bunch of that in my music. So obviously you need to have had lots of experience with your fellow, fellow band members so that they know your energy in that um, with those improvisations. Yeah. So I would say, I mean, you can do it with, with session musicians that you played with for the first time. It's just not as good. Um, it's a, a feel thing. So if you've been playing with the same bunch of musicians for a while, they understand where you tend to go in your solos, what, what, what are trends while improvising. Um, and, you know, if, if it goes from a soft, gentle part of the solo and – it goes to a loud, more aggressive part in the solo. You know, if you've been playing with guys for a long time, that will happen naturally. You won't have to look at them and say, okay, well, in the next bar or so, we, we're going to be doing this, you know. Um, so that, that happens more naturally. And if you're playing with musicians you haven't played with a lot, 
you know, it's a little bit more difficult to communicate on on stage. It's a, it's more of a body language thing more than you know, kind of uh, raising an eyebrow or, or shouting something across the yeah. stage. It's, it's like they can feel it with you. The, yeah. the, the solo will naturally feel the needs to go there, and they can feel that too. So it is a big, big part, kind of having some sort of consistency with the, the musicians you played with. So I love this game. I know I have, I have to ask this question in two minutes, two years, five minutes. I know your answer will be different every time. Simply because in millions of them. I'm not saying favorite. I'm saying top of mind. If you had to push play to five songs by other artists once you finish this conversation, what would those five songs be about? Okay, so the first guy that comes to mind is my biggest influence, Steve Ray Vaughan. Um, so I would probably have to say... Um, a Texas Flood by Steve Ray Vaughan. That's, that's just like a staple for me, and it's one that just came to mind. Um, another one that comes to mind, a song that I've been very, very recently introduced to, even though I've known this artist for a while, which is a guy called Chris Stapleton. Um, he's got a song called The Fire. That's a great tune. Jeez. Um, uh, Pink Floyd, Shine and You Crazy Diamond, massive one for me. Elton John's uh, Tiny Dancer, also just a an incredible, incredible tune, like just, just unreal. And then I would have to say um, probably um, Scar on the Sky by um, Chris Cornell. Those will be the five that come up. Yes. So Dan, the podcast is listened to throughout the world. So as a final message, what would you like to say? I would like to say I'd love people to check out my new record. If you've heard me or, uh, or you haven't heard me, um, give Moving On a listen. And uh, give me a follow on social media to keep up up to date with where we're touring, where we're going to be. And, um, yeah, look forward to seeing some of your listeners at some live shows. Thank you for listening to this episode of Celeb Savant. Please follow Barrett on TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook at Celeb Savant. That's C-E-L-E-B-S-A-V-A-N-T.